I do want to get to this video here just released by the U.S. Central Command showing a B-1 bomber that took part in those U.S. retaliatory strikes. Now, the U.S. saying that it hit more than 85 targets in Iraq and Syria. And this morning, an Iraqi militia official appearing to downplay the U.S. strikes and hinting at an attempt to de-escalate tensions in the Middle East. Now, we are also getting a word here from officials both in Iraq and Syria that the death toll from these strikes is about 40. A lot to all of this here, so I do want to bring in a friend of the show to help break it down. Mark Chandler is the director of government relations and a professor of practice in the Department of Intelligence and Community Studies at Coastal Carolina University. He is also a former senior intelligence defense official. As always, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us and help break down a very complicated subject. Good morning, and, and you're quite welcome, Josh. Hopefully we can create some understanding here this morning. Of course, and I wanna go kind of back to basics first and break down the details. What is it that we know so far about these U.S. strikes over in Iraq and Syria? Well, first and foremost, Josh, let me say thanks to the military and the service members who conducted this uh, dangerous operation. Number one, uh, they achieved, I believe, the tactical success that was asked of them to achieve. So, and they were all returned safely. So I think that's important. I wanna put that out there first and foremost. And, and what they did actually was attack about six or seven different areas in Iraq and Syria, where you had both IRGC, Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps personnel, and the Shia militias, the Iran-backed Shia militias. Those were all known targets. And as a matter of fact, during my time in the Pentagon and the Marine Corps, we had struck those targets uh, previously. So they struck those, they used 85 sub-targets within that. So describing a target might be a compound and there might be six or seven locations on that compound where they actually struck. Those are individual targets. And they launched some 125 precision munitions using B-1s based in the United States, which is a long haul, but something we have done before. And also some of those fighter aircraft that we had in the Middle East already that we positioned a couple of months ago. So tactical success on a wide ranging mission and set of targets. And I wanna talk about the mission itself. What is the ultimate goal here for the US? Is it about taking out some uh, military there or is it about sending a message? Is it kind of a mixture of both? Well, I, I think that's a good question, Josh. And I think one thing, let me kind of separate what we hear coming out of the Pentagon, the White House, and the State Department at this time, and then what we should be trying to do militarily. So number one, I haven't heard a strategy and I haven't heard what the overall objectives of this campaign. This isn't a single set of targets according to the White House and, and the Pentagon. So what are our objectives from for this campaign? And when I look at that, I have to say that, okay, I haven't heard that. And so we need to know that to be able to answer your question thoroughly, I'd have to know what those are. But what I see is this is kind of a public relations campaign. First thing you hear yesterday when we start talking about this is we hit 85 targets. We used 125 munitions. We used a B-1 bomber from the United States. This is a public relations campaign showing the U.S. military strength and capabilities to strike around the world at any time of our choosing. But did it achieve the objectives that we should be focused on? Tactically, yes, I believe we hit those targets. But broader on deterrence, I'm not so sure we did that. But, but are we really trying to deter because we've had plenty of opportunities to do so? So I have to balance that out between the success that these service members had versus what the administration is trying to say we're doing. So I think and you're going to see this today. You're going to see a lot of photos come out of damaged buildings, destroyed buildings. And that's kind of leading to, hey, we did something because we had to do something. But, but truly, what did we achieve? That's the question. And I do want to pull up this video. You were talking about video pictures and all of that that will come out. And this is video that was released a short time that shows one of those B-1 bombers you're looking at there. Now, Iran's president sent a threat to the U.S. Friday saying that, quote, it will not start a war, but if a country, if a cruel force wants to bully us, the Islamic Republic of Iran will give a strong response. What do you make of that statement? I feel like you and I have been on here multiple times and we have talked about threats from Iran. What do you make of that latest statement there? 
Well, I, I, number one, I'm not surprised by it. I, I believe after last Sunday's attack that, that killed three U.S. service members, I think after that, Iran had to set the stage to try to publicly threaten the United States because actually they, they haven't felt any cost. Iran has felt no cost. So putting that out there, again, not unexpected. I think they're just trying to set the stage for a possible retaliation. And, and I fully expect retaliation. I mean, you're going to have to do that if you're Iran to show strength to their populace, to the Ayatollahs, and to the Shia militias out there. So working through that, I, I think it's kind of balancing out what the, it was expected to be happen from the United States at this time. I do think they'll do something, but they would have done something anyway, Josh, without that statement or not. And they've made those statements since 1979. So, so this is not out of character for, for the Iranian regime. Why is Iran not being struck here? Is that something that could potentially happen? Because again, we're talking about Iraq, we're talking about Syria, but not Iran. Well, that's the old $64,000 question, Josh. Why are we not striking Iran? They, they are behind all of these attacks against the U.S. forces in the Middle East. They're behind what the Houthis are doing. They're behind the October 7th attack that Hamas conducted on Israel, and they're behind what Hezbollah, Lebanese Hezbollah, are doing in uh, northern Israel. So you've got to look at this overall strategy that Iran has had. And, and when we talk about this, I go back to what are the objectives, what, are our, what is our strategy for these attacks that we conducted yesterday? And so when I'm looking at that, if it's to deter, then we have to go to Iran. And, and listen, I have fought in two wars in the Middle East. I don't want to see another war, but honestly, weakness is what's going to drive us to a war, not striking back with strength and focus on the true perpetrators behind all of those attacks. And that's Iran. We do not have to hit Tehran itself. We don't have to hit any major population center. I could go in, and matter of fact, I know they exist, targets of the IRGC near the coast. We could hit some economic targets out there. We could we could create cost for Iran and show them that it's, it's going to be too much in those costs for you to continue pushing these attacks against the United States. And I think until we do that, you're going to see Iran continue to, to rattle sabers and attack U.S. forces. It may not be tomorrow, although I do think we're going to see a counterattack from the Shia militia soon, but it's it's going to happen. I mean, Iran has actually been at war with us since 1979. I can go back to the 1983 bomb, Beirut bombing barracks where we killed 241 service members. I can go back to when they attacked us after we invaded in 2003, Iran IRGC were in Iraq at causing the death of U.S. service members. So they have a long history of this. They haven't been deterred overall, but at some point we have to send a message and we have to impose cost against Iran itself. What is the strategy? I'm not sure this administration has one that's been clearly identified, either internally and especially externally to, to the American public and to those who wish us harm in the Middle East. And we're talking about a lot of statements here. So let's talk about one from Hezbollah. They said that, quote, they're announcing the suspension of military and security operations against the occupation forces in order to prevent embarrassment to the Iraqi government. What is the significance of that statement overall? What are they trying to say? Well, I think that goes back to what Iran said about, you know, retaliation should anyone strike their interests and their targets. And by the way, technically, we did strike their interests and their targets by hitting some IRGC facilities in Iraq and Syria. So we'll see how that plays out. But as for Hezbollah, I think they were trying to, well, I know that they were trying to manage the messaging. After conducting the strikes, strikes they then came out and said, we're not going to do this anymore. So what it's trying to do is create that, that international messaging, if you will, that, that says we can now retaliate against the United States because they attacked us after we said we were going to stop. Now, let's let's not forget that there's mm -hmm. been hundreds of this on something attacks already against the U.S. forces there. Not just these three deaths, but we lost a civilian contractor in Syria about two months ago as a result of Iraqi attack. I mean, Iranian attacks. 
And then finally, we've lost two SEALs. So when I look at this, I think that Khatib Hezbollah messaging was merely to try to play to the court of public opinion out there and give them some pseudo justification, if you will, for continuing attacks against us because now we're perceived as the aggressor. Well, should we expect to see more strikes soon? You kind of already touched on this, but is that something that we do expect we are going to see maybe in the coming hours, days, weeks? How long until we see another strike? Because it does sound like President Biden has said, we're not done yet. Well, and they have, and they had, we're not done yet. They've used the phrase campaign. This is a series of strikes. So a campaign lasts for days or weeks. And it starts to spread that out. Now, if the administration did its job, if it followed the military advisors and, and they focused on things, we should see another round of strikes today or this evening overnight in Iraq and Syria. So we should see another round of strikes as soon as today to go after. Now, the process that's actually taking place now, and it started last night, is the intelligence community is going through and they're looking and analyzing each one of those target areas that were attacked last night. And they'll determine what we call BDA, battle damage assessment. And through that analysis and whatever their objectives that they were told, destroy this building, destroy this command and control center, they will give an evaluation that we achieve success or we did not achieve success. And where we did not, we should, Restrike those targets. So we have to ensure that we met the objectives on those targets. Then we should have a second set of targets ready to go and we should strike those. It, it should be to maintain the pressure that has to be maintained on this. They, they should start tonight and we should start to see more assets into the region. And perhaps in addition to just manned fighter aircraft, we should see some cruise missile attacks also coming from our naval assets. So that's what we should be seeing. This should be a sustained in campaign if the true intent and true objective is to go out there and destroy some of these. But I don't know, are we destroying or are we deterring? That's the big question. And I want to talk a little bit more about the conflict in the Middle East between Israel, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis. There's a lot going on and there's a lot of different topics that you and I have discussed over the past, I would say, several weeks and really several months at this point. Hamas yes. has yet to respond to the latest uh, ceasefire deal that would allegedly release all of those hostages that do remain that were taken on October 7th. What might be the holdup there? Well, I, I think you've got a couple of critical things. This actually started a couple of weeks ago, and it, and it was a complicated six-phase peace proposal that, that was worked between Qatar, Egypt, uh, Israel, Hamas, and the United States. So all those parties were talking behind closed doors. That one about two weeks ago completely fell apart. It was just too complicated. So you're into about three phases right now of this current agreement and arrangement that we're looking at. So when I look at this, the key components are the release of the hostages, as you talked about, but there's a critical sticking point. And that, that's where Israel and Hamas are diametrically opposed. One of those is Hamas says, we want full withdrawal of Israeli forces from Gaza. Israel says they don't want to do that. So we're talking about a what's on the table is a six-week pause or cessation of hostilities. And then once that begins, we start releasing the hostages. But the key sticking point, as I said, is will Israel withdraw from Gaza? That would be a military disaster. Uh, all the gains that they have made in the last several months to try to push Hamas back, and you still have at least half or a little bit more of Hamas fighting capability in existence. That would put, that would make Israel lose all of those military gains and set its objectives back while allowing Hamas the opportunity to refit, rearm, and resupply, which is what they want. So how Hamas responds to this, not getting their way, and Israel, in my opinion, needs to stay strong and not lose its military gains, I think that's where you're going to see things start to break down if they're going to break down is right there at that key point of withdrawal versus not withdrawal. A lot of great information there. My last question for you is going to be about the Houthis. I know this is kind of a, a loaded question and a hard question to answer, but what is the latest with that situation there involving the Houthis? You know, if we go back a few weeks, Josh, when we started, we saw the U.S.-U.K. attacks. They've done two rounds of those. 
You see the U.S. conducting limited pinpoint strikes against uploaded missiles or other facilities right there. Uh, and just the other day, uh, the Houthis were preparing to launch a surface to air missile against U.S. aircraft. We took that out. Uh, this hasn't stopped the Houthis. They continue to load up missiles. They continue to fire. I, I mean, as recently, I believe, as today, they've tried to attack shipping out there. They've gone directly against U.S. naval vessels operating in the area. So our deterrence effect and our degradation, while minimal on degradation, we still haven't deterred the Houthis from conducting these attacks. I mean, we start, we have seen the negative impact on shipping uh, throughout the European area and even the United States. You know, you've got shipping companies that won't go through there. So we don't have a safe passage area through the Bab al-Mandeb or the Red Sea at this time. And the Houthis have not been destroyed. Their capabilities have not been destroyed. So they're going to strike back. Matter of fact, I would expect the, an uptick in Houthi strikes and show sol solidarity with their Iranian-backed Shia militia who were attacked last night. So I'm going to see this kind of balance out and some public messaging start to take place, considering they all are managed, controlled, and, and supported by Iran. All right. Mark Chandler there with Coastal Carolina University. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us and break down all the latest details. There's a lot to it, and we appreciate you being here with us pretty much on a weekly basis. Anything else you want to add about any of this before I let you go? Well, well, Josh, I want to go back a little bit to that Iranian statement, the Iranian threat, and some of the words that I hear the administration talking about not seeking escalation, not wanting a war in, in the Middle East. You know, I don't know what our strategy is. It's hard to determine that, as I said. But, but there is already war with Iran, but it's from an Iranian perspective. And, and what's happened here and what's critical to understand is the United States does not control the tempo of this campaign. The tempo and the, the escalation ladder, if you will, is controlled by Iran. They have been attacking us, and I gave those examples for decades of what they've done. The 160-something attacks now are controlled by Iran. We didn't need to suffer those three deaths last week. We could have stopped these attacks against U.S. forces about 140 attacks ago had we sent a strong deterrence message at that time. Iran does not want to fight the U.S. in a one-for-one -one war. The cost would be extreme. It would be regime would falter, uh, perhaps collapse. And so you have to look at that and realize that it's time for the U.S. to use strength and not worry about escalation. We have to control the tempo here. I am not advocating war in any sense of the imagination, but I am advocating strength through deterrence if we need to do that. Because as I said, we don't control the tempo at this time. Iran is kind of calling the shots on how this plays out, even though we had a big public success last night, and that's how it's going to play out. I'm not trying to be a cynic. I'm just trying to be a realist here. And I guess it's not even a question to ask who has the stronger military, the U.S. or Iran, and its uh, proxies there. I think the answer is probably the U.S., right? Correct. We have the strongest. We just need to utilize it. All right, Mark, thank you again for taking the time to be here with us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss this with you. Of course.